Well, welcome everybody to our session today, uh, where you'll hear about four different perspectives to climate change impacts on the North Atlantic and Irish waters. My name is Glenn Nolan. I'm the head of Oceanographic and Climate Services at the Marine Institute in Galway. Uh, I've been active in ICES for about 20 years, having served as a working group chair in oceanic hydrography and contributed data uh, to the ICES data centre as an oceanographer over that time. And I'm delighted to moderate this session today. Climate change and its likely impacts are as high on the agenda in Ireland as everywhere else. In this session, we're going to bring together four scientists working in very different but closely linked fields to explore what we know and what we don't know about climate change in our waters. The first presentation by Jared McCarthy will focus on the changes in the wider North Atlantic heat content and other indicators such as the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Second presentation by Dave Reed, who's already famous this morning, <laughs> uh, examines changes in the distributions of fish species around Ireland. Uh, Ireland is a crossroads for Lusitanian boreal fish species, and we'll look at some of the changes observed to date. Ireland's coasts contain blue carbon habitats where carbon is sequestrated and stored long term, uh, habitats like seagrass beds and salt marshes. Uh, this is the subject of our third presentation by Grace Cott. And our final presentation by Ema Manning examines the social dimension of the evidence presented in the previous talks in the context of climate justice. We we'll consider how issues like fish distribution changes and temperature effects on salt marshes play out in the public arena, looking at coastal communities and those whose livelihoods depend on an ocean that is rapidly changing. So we'll have our four talks in sequence and then we'll open up to you for questions uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jared McCarthy. Jared, is a, Jared you can probably head up towards the podium and I'll, I'll uh, read, read about all your, your, your greatness here. Uh, Jared is an oceanographer working in the Icarus Centre, which is the Irish Climate Research and Analysis Unit in Maynooth University, where he leads a team of seven oceanographers and climate scientists. His research interests are in physical oceanography, specializing in the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, what we call the AMOC in, in physical oceanography. Uh, and he has a particular interest in how this has evolved in the 20th century. And since 2017, he's worked on one of the very key uh, topics in terms of what we need to know about climate change around our island nation. And that's looking at sea level change since the mid 19th century. So the title of Jared's talk is Ocean Climate Change, the Unequivocal and the Unintuitive, Jared. And thank you, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to ICES and to the Marine Institute for the invite to speak today. So my talk today is talking about uh, the unequivocal and the unintuitive, which is a bit of a, I suppose, a mismatch of uh, what's going on in terms of what's happening with the climate. My name is Gerard McCarthy, as, as Glenn has introduced me already. I won't say much, but I work in the Irish Climate Research Unit, which is based in Maynooth University, just a little bit to the east of, of Dublin. So. Um, forward. Okay, so I think we're on the, on the road now. Um, okay, so I think to start any um, any talk about climate really should start with the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Uh, for so many years, they've been the real uh, gold standard in terms of understanding what's going on with climate. To start off with, I think it is important to just say this is the leading the leading statement from the 2021 Working Group One um, report. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land with widespread rapid changes in the ocean, atmosphere, and cryosphere and biosphere having occurred. So that's what happened in 2021. And I wanted to go back to 2007. So in 2007, it was a very seminal moment in terms of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. That was the year that the IPCC got awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for the, the work that they were doing. At that stage, the phrase was that we had very high confidence that the global average net effect of human activities was one of warming. So from 2007 to 2021, 
we've gone from very high confidence to unequivocal. The climate is changing and it is us. The evidence for this climate change is evident across the climate system from carbon dioxide increasing, ocean warming, sea level rising, global temperature increasing, and the only line that's going down there is Arctic sea ice extent, so the summer sea ice extent going from about 7 million cubic kilometres back in the late 1970s to about half of that in the present day. I also picked 2007 as well because I was finishing up a physics degree um, at that stage and I decided I wanted to become a climate scientist. So I chose oceanography and um, at the time it was probably kind of a spirit of adventure in terms of wanting to get out in the sea and go on research cruises that really made me to choose oceanography. But apocryphally I can kind of explain it in terms of climate by saying I chose oceanography because climate change is ocean change. The fundamental fact about global warming and climate change is that the greenhouse gases that we're emitting are being trapped in the atmosphere and this is causing a radiative, of a growing radiative of imbalance. The energy that's being trapped in the climate system is overwhelmingly going into the ocean, but over 93% of it um, being, being trapped in ocean warming. Now, uh, you have two versions of, of, of that same plot there. You've got the, the, the pizza, uh, the pizza uh, diagram and you've got the, the line plot, but there's a huge amount of change and most of it is going into the ocean. This is in terms of heating, um, but also in terms of carbon sequestration also. Now, in Ireland, we are basically seeing very similar changes to what's going on on a global basis. So the little inset of the map here, the green area shows what is named by the uh, Marine Institute as the real map of Ireland. So Ireland is a small island, but it's a large ocean nation. And uh, that large ocean is warming in line more or less with what's happening in the rest of the world. So the green lines here are what's going on in Ireland and the blue lines are what's going on in the global pattern. So we can see warming. Now we see some variations. You'd expect to see some variations. Um, my statistical colleagues would probably say that it's absolutely impossible for these two lines to be the same. But uh, you see some variations around, uh, around, uh, around the global average, but there is unequivocal warming occurring in Irish waters. So that's the unequivocal. What about the unintuitive? So um, I suppose the Irish people in the audience will, will commend me on my restraint for taking it onto slide four, tell you that I'm from Cork. So I grew, up, I grew up on the south coast of Ireland in Cork and uh, we were always told that the mild climate of Ireland was down to the Gulf Stream. There's a great uh, phrase here from a very nice paper from Dave Ellis from 1993 uh, about the west of Scotland, so a very similar climate there. In the west of Scotland, chance remarks to elderly ladies upon the warmth of winter's day invariably bring the reply, aye, it's the Gulf Stream, you know. And it really has kind of permeated through kind of our kind of uh, understanding of the climate that the Gulf Stream is really important. Now, in terms of uh, physical oceanography, I have to say, of course, that it's not just the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a very, has its analogues in the Kuroshio or the Agulhas Current and isn't unique in its own right, but it is, um, it is unique as part of the wider Gulf Stream system, which is where warm water is being moved no northwards and, and cold water being returned southwards at depth, part of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And we know as scientists that the Gulf Stream system will weaken. At least that's what the models have been telling us for quite a long time. So on the left hand side, we've got a, a multi-model ensemble from the CMIP-6 archive with various different uh, climate scenarios going into the future. And we can see that all of these show a relative weakling of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Interesting point is that there's not much different depending on which scenario you're on. So we're on this trajectory, whether we like it or not. Uh, so this has been uh, captured some imagination as well. So if you go back to 2004, the film The Day After Tomorrow was inspired by this kind of, um, this kind of idea of the, a quick overturning collapse. Okay, so the Gulf Stream system will weaken. All the models say the same thing, uh, but will it? So when you actually look at the observations of the Gulf Stream system of the overturning circulation, there's quite a lot been going on in the 20th century. There's been a weakening through the 1960s. There's been a strengthening through the 1990s and a weakening again in the uh, early 2010s or around the 2010s, we'll say. Now, the climate models don't get this. So the climate models can not simulate what has actually been occurring in the 20th century. And the question is, of course, if the climate models can't simulate the past, how can we really trust them to simulate the future? This is in contrast, uh, what's been happening here. Sorry, the clicker's gone again. So 
what we would really like in terms of having a very assured, you know, moving towards that unequivocal statement, um, what we would like is that all of those green lines that you see in the top would fit within that grey envelope of the models. It's not what is happening in terms of the Gulf Stream system changes. This is very different to other fields such as uh, global uh, mean sea level change or ocean heat content, where the change from the fifth assessment report to the sixth assessment report put those green bars within that grey envelope and thus kind of moving towards those unequivocal statements. Now I'm about halfway through my slides and I haven't even mentioned fish yet at the ICS ASC. Uh, still no fish yet, but we're talking about unequivocal changes in terms of the climate system. So as things warm, uh, what this is really showing as things warm, that uh, colder ecosystems move a little bit farther towards the poles. So there's a lot to see in this figure, but I always look over maybe kind of uh, Eurasia where you can see the temperate ecosystems kind of moving up into the boreal kind of side of things. So as things warm up, we can see that the warm moves farther to the poles. That makes a lot of sense. And there are some fish uh, that responds to these physical indicators. So if we um, look at blue whiting, this is a, a couple of slides taken from Mark Payne's work a couple of years back. Uh, we can see blue whiting has a very um, a dependent distribution depending on whether we've got cold and fresh situations and warm or warm and saline. So I usually show this in lectures and I get the students to guess which one of these years was more recent. This is after kind of warming them up with a lot of pictures about warming and uh, uh, warming in Irish waters. But of course, this isn't uh, the most recent picture is not the one on the warm and saline front with the expanded blue whiting uh, distribution. We've actually got a cold and fresh and a more contracted distribution of blue whiting in, in the more recent years on this particular one, which is actually in line with what's been going on in terms of the changes in, in ocean circulation and those abrupt changes in, in the Gulf Stream system that I was talking about. But again, this is a little bit unintuitive. So it, it, it indicates that you kind of really need to understand the system that you are working on to, um, to, to really understand where you're going. So the final thing I'm going to say is that uh, there is hope and that there is a lot of kind of future in terms of the, the linking together of this physical understanding and the futures of fisheries. So first of all, to say the ocean is not predictable everywhere, uh, but the North Atlantic does appear to be one of the one of the places where on decadal timescales. So when we talk about decadal timescales, we're talking maybe five to 10 years. We're talking about planning timescales, the timescales that you have discussions with governments about. So the Atlantic is one of those places that is actually predictable. So the dots on the, the, on, uh, on the, the green on the right hand side show that the North Atlantic is, is relatively predictable. And so this leveraging this prediction allows for some skillful of some pelagic fish species. And the, the example here is taken from blue whiting. This was a great benefit to us here in Ireland in recent years in Killybegs and Donegal, which is Ireland's largest fishing port. Blue whiting had been a, a recent growth stock. And I think that's tailed off in the last couple of years, but that is that is where we were. So my take home messages are that there are multiple unequivocal indicators of man made climate change throughout the whole climate system. But there are still plenty of un unintuitive or un unresolved um, uh, things to, to understand. And a better understanding of this physical system is essential for managing a changing climate and managing ecosystem and ecosystem change as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dave Reid, Professor Dave Reid. I have to use his formal title now. He's the principal investigator in ecosystem based fisheries management at the Marine Institute. He's worked for 32 years in fisheries management on fisheries sustainability, fishing capacity and efforts, industry collaboration, as well as integrated ecosystem assessment and ecological risk analysis. A lot of acronyms there, Dave. Uh, his title, the title of his presentation is Climate Change and Fisheries in Irish Waters. Dave. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, yeah, it's me again. Um, I do apologize. Uh, so a couple of giants that I'm standing on the shoulders of to give this presentation are Louise Vaughan, uh, my postdoc on the Climb Fish project, and Jed Kemp, my PhD on another project, who, who basically did all this work and I'm simply parasiting on it. Um, and, and so that's UCC, University College Cork, and uh, the newly dubbed Atlantic Technical University, where those two guys are based. Um, yeah, is it the green button forward? Yeah, there we go. Um, so there's, 
really three different ways, uh, broadly three different ways that climate change can affect fish populations. Um, phenology, which is, is just basically the timing of life history events, when you spawn, when you, um, uh, when you grow up in a, a nursery area and so on. Um, productivity, which can be straight through from growth, reproductive material, recruitment into the adult population. And then comes distribution and abundance. And this is one that certainly attracts a lot of attention publicly. And this is what I'm going to focus on because we have the best data right now for that. Um, I'm going to give you three examples and, and Jared give a really nice segue into this. Uh, so I'm going to look at another uh, pelagic species, mackerel, and how it's moving north in relation to warming. I'm going to look at it, whether we can see climate change effects in the, in the changing abundance of fish species. And then we'll have a look at the fish communities around Ireland and see if they're changing with climate change. And then we'll maybe get confused. Um, so is macro moving further north? So this is some work done by Catherine Cunningham, uh, sorry, Catherine Hughes, way back in uh, 2014, a uh, student at uh, the Institute. And, and what she looked at here in this figure is, is the uh, center of gravity of spawning of, of the Northeast Atlantic macro, which you, we get the spawning, the egg distribution from IC surveys, ICs, yay. And uh, you can see from this figure that, you know, things were fairly stable. The, the center of gravity of spawning truckled along about 55 degrees north for some years, up to somewhere in the late 1990s, and then started to move steadily north. And you can then look at that in terms of the water temperatures that they're experiencing. And essentially, you get a movement northwards of about 38 kilometers for every degree of increase in the water temperature. And out here, you are getting an increase in the water temperature, so you're getting a movement further north. Now, a word of caution with this one is that at the same time, the macro population was increasing and so would want to spread out over a wider area anyway, which may have an impact on that centre of gravity. And you can sort of see this in this this what this data, which I got from uh, uh, yep, from Brendan O'Hay. Sorry, I'm suffering an old man's forgetting names thing to do. Um, anyway, so in, in 2004, the macro leg survey was, was uh, showed this sort of pattern. This is what I grew up with when I was leading this survey. And you, you could you can see that the the distribution is nicely tight along the shelf break and then it fades out as you go further north. And what you found in more recent years, 2016 merely an example, is that they're now spreading out all over the ocean with all sorts of impacts on things that are going on. Uh, you know, suddenly Iceland thinks it owns all the macro and you know, that sort of stuff. So it, it has real importance. Now to go back to that picture of the, of the center of gravity, and there's that point where it maybe is an inflection point. And this is some more of Mark Payne's work. Mark Payne was a, a great resource to us and he's now gone off to do something else, sadly. Um, but the, what you see there is the same point. That's the, the habitat area occupied by the mackerel. And it's, it's increasing at about the same time as it's moving further north. And you saw that on the map. So here are some pretty clear evidence of, of distributional changes and indeed abundance changes linked to the, uh, to the climate change. So I'll move on now. Too many cigarettes while I was being tense this morning. Um, so I'm going to look at, can we see these climate change effects in the, in the abundance of fish in the Celtic Sea? So this is the work of, of Jed Kemp, my PhD student. And he's, he does all sorts of wonderful things. It, uh, uh, starts with a dynamic factor analysis to find out what he should focus on, and then a redundancy analysis to look at relationships. I'm not going to go into the details because I don't understand it. It's one of the joys of being an old scientist is to be outstripped by your students. Um, so we use 12 uh, got, out, out of that initial step, we got 12 fish species from the FAOA survey, the French survey in our waters. We use the French survey because it goes further down into the southern end of the Celtic Sea. There's an Irish survey there as well, and we use it for some other things also. Uh, we looked at fishing pressure here, uh, proxied by F over FMSY, so the, the observed fishing mortality over the target fishing mortality. And we included five ecosystem variables um, which came through on that dynamic factor analysis. So we're trying to stop just throwing every ecosystem variable we can at it. We, we have a 
chosen set of variables. So net primary production, sea bottom temperature, these are mostly demersal fish, uh, two species of Calanus representing two indicators, Finmarchicus and Helgolandicus, a, a, a Lusitanian species and a boreal species. And finally, uh, the NEO as a, at least a proxy for the stuff that Jared was talking about with the AMOC. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really delighted when I'm ever able to put up a presentation that's got one of these things in it, because <laughs> it, it makes you feel like a scientist, you know? Uh, and there's stuff going on here, you know? Um, so, so this is a triplot from the redundancy analysis, and, and there's a few messages here. I'm not going to make this overbearing, but FER is, is, the, is a sort of combined um, fishing mortality, relative fishing mortality, F over F is my, for a, a whole lot of species, uh, not cod, and I'll come back to that. And, and what you can see is that's negatively, across the triplot, it's negatively linked to things like haddock, hake, place, some of the ray species, dogfish, and so on. No big surprise that fishing mortality is a very strong driver of, of the abundance changes in, in the fish population. Um, cod came out somewhat different in a different sort of orthogonal relationship, but again, no surprise, the fishing mortality on cod drives the cod, the changes in cod abundance, and interestingly, the whiting as well. But the real bummer is the next one. Um, so in the middle there, you've got most of the ecosystem variables. You've got sea bottom temperature, the North Atlantic Oscillation, and, and the abundance of uh, Calanus helgolandicus, which is this, which is the uh, southern species, uh, the the, Boreal, the the Lusitanian species. Finmarchicus, the, the one that's out there at the side, is actually a, a, the only ecosystem variable we found that had any relationship with abundance whatsoever. And Finmarchicus is the classic herring Finmarchicus relationship you'll have heard of. It's a nice, uh, profitable uh, Calanus praetifido. So, sorry, so the, the, the bottom line here is, is that when Jake brought me this first result, he was terribly, terribly proud of it, and I'm delighted he was. And I just went, oh, wow, okay, so you've proved that fishing is the main thing that drives fishing popula fish populations up and down. And he was extremely cross with me for quite a long time after that one. And, and in fact, what this is really interesting, because what this is saying is that, that notwithstanding what you'd expect to happen with climate change, if you insist on killing most of the animals every year, it's very difficult to see a relationship appearing. And we'll see that again in the next presentation. Um, have fish communities changed? So this was the abundance by species. This one's about the whole communities, and this is Louise Vaughan's work. Um, so she did her analysis with Mann and Kendall tests and or GLMs, doesn't matter, uh, with a Tweedy distribution. I'm yet to understand what a Tweedy distribution is. And, and this time we looked at um, both Irish and French bottom trawl surveys, the, the FAOA and the IGFS. The, the red ones further up are the Irish and the blue are the French. And, and we looked at, the analysis was done looking at both the, the boreal communities and the Lusitanian communities. So where, you know, the, the, I guess the baseline hypothesis would have been that the, the boreal species, the northern ones, would be diminishing or the, the fish community would be reducing in our waters, whereas the Lusitanian would be coming in. So, and we also broke it up into ICES subregion so we could see what was happening. One of the backgrounds to this was we were regularly asked for advice on on effects of climate change on fisheries and Irish waters. And the previous analysis of this type was done uh, back in 2010. It became a bit embarrassing to continually refer to a 2010 report. Um, so what we looked at were these, oh, oh it's got a bit weird. Um, so this is the, the results from the only two regions in which we got a, a really significant, uh, no, a significant effect. So this is the, the Kendall's tow along the bottom. The distribution you'd expect is the is the is the dashed red line. The green is the median of the observed, and the black is a, a, a smoother through the the Kendall's tow distribution. And these are the only two in which we found significant but very small changes in the communities, and it was only Lusitanian communities. So no significant changes in the boreal communities anywhere in Irish waters. And significant increase in the Lusitanian species, uh, Lusitanian communities in the Celtic Sea, which is the southern end. So you'd sort of you'd expect if there were Lusitanian species coming in, that's where they'd come in. Um, but some species do show changes. So this is uh, this is actually 
anchovy, which is a Lusitania species, not demersal, but pelagic, but whatever. Uh, and what you see here is is the blue stuff is is where sorry the orange stuff is where they were where we were seeing them uh, back at, in the first decade of the century and then after that the blues are showing where they are and, and the abundance is in the second decade and you can see a spread and you can see an abundance increase and anchovy are moving in and and soon we'll be taking over the biscuit anchovy fisheries. Um, Another example is, is snake pipefish. Many of you have heard of this, and this is a great example of a warning to the unwary. Um, so in, in around about 2007-8, there was a, a sudden notice that there were snake pipefish, which is, for those of you who don't know, is a sort of straightened out seahorse. And it was, it was turning up everywhere along the western edge. I did a macro survey in that year and you were getting all these eggs turning up in it. And, and of course, the immediate response was, way, climate change, we've got an indicator of climate change. Two years later, uh, between the 2008-2009, the that's the orange, uh, and a few years later is the blue, and they'd gone. And, and if you go back into the literature, in fact, there have been these snake pipefish explosions in the past, right back to the beginning of the 20th century. So uh, the, the, even if you see something like that anchovy thing, your immediate thought is, hmm, must be climate change. Be really careful what you think about. It. Now, why is all this, why are we seeing so little of uh, impact in the Celtic Sea, particularly in our water? And, and I think it's because you could sort of see it when you looked at, uh, at Gerard's pictures, but this is a shorter time period. This is the 1990s onwards. And, and what you've got is that during that period, and as an interaction with the AMOC and, and the North Atlantic circulation generally, is that the sea bottom temperature in the Celtic Sea has, if anything, decreased over that period. This is not significant. It's basically a flat line, both in, in sea surface temperature and uh, sea bottom temperatures. And so there's nothing much changing here. And this, as, as a scientist who then wants to go on and predict what will happen next and help you make mitigation plans, this, this is a real downer. You know, uh, what, what, what we really want is lots and lots of evidence that climate change is causing such and such a change and if we reject it, it produces that. It also leaves you in a trap of looking like you're a climate change denier. Uh, and, and I promise you, uh, please understand I'm not. So to conclude, what are the effects of climate change and um, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, it's a bit confusing actually. Um, but my conclusions are, yeah, pelagics seem to be the ones that are likely to show changes and do show changes. Um, main driver of demersal fish abundance remains fishing pressure, not the environment. Demersal fish communities remain largely unchanged for the moment, though you do get some southern species coming in. And so far, warming due to climate change is not very evident in these waters over this period from this study. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Grace Cott. Uh, Grace is an assistant professor in plant biology at UCD, which is just down the road from here. Uh, she's the leader of the Blue Carbon Research Lab and a Marie Curie alumna. Her research is focused on quantifying carbon stocks and sequestration rates and greenhouse gas emissions from salt marsh habitats and coastal reed swamps and assessing plant and habitat responses to climate change. Grace is the lead principal investigator on a Marine Institute funded project focused on investigating Ireland's blue carbon potential across salt marsh, seagrass and nearshore habitats. So Grace is going to tell us about blue carbon in Irish waters. Grace. Great, so thank you very much. And it's uh, it's really great to have this opportunity today to talk to the ISIS community about coastal blue carbon and the effects of climate change on these systems. So we're all well aware that oceans and coastal marine systems play a significant role in the global carbon cycle and they represent the largest long term sink of carbon. So it's really important that we understand then how climate change is actually affecting uh, this carbon sink. So increasing temperatures and including sea level rise as well. So the term blue carbon itself actually stems back to reports by the United Nations Environment Programme in 2009, whereby through the colour framework, they defined blue carbon as the carbon sequestered and stored in the ocean. So quite a broad definition. But in recent years, it's come really in particular 
to be defined as the carbon accumulating in vegetated, tidally influenced coastal ecosystems such as tidal marshes or salt marshes, um, mangrove habitats and also seagrass meadows. So in Hawaii, I guess, um, particularly for these three ecosystems, the concept of blue carbon has gained ground over the last decade or so is because they're particularly efficient carbon sinks, firstly. Secondly, that carbon is actually uh, sequestered in situ, so in it directly in that habitat. And thirdly, these habitats tend to occur in one country's jurisdiction. And so overall, that makes them amenable to management. So within that blue carbon concept, it's inherently linked to management. Now, why are these systems so good at, at sequestering the carbon? So if we look at the processes involved here. So we, you know, the plants make up, uh, the, they're the ecosystem engineers here, essentially. They're doing all that hard work. They're drawing down the CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And here I just focus on salt marsh and sea grasses because we don't have mangrove habitats here in the North Atlantic. Um, but we see that the, the, the drawdown with, with photosynthesis, that carbon then gets stored long term in the sediments. And what's really important here is the low decomposition rates in these soils or sediments. So when there's very little oxygen because they're waterlogged so frequently, um, then decomposition doesn't occur. Or if it does, it occurs at a very slow rate. So and that's similar in seagrass beds as well. Now, another process here as well is that the sediments come in with the tide. Um, and that the, the vegetation, usually quite dense, slows down that water column and allows sediments to flocculate out. And that can further build then uh, these habitats. It can consolidate the carbon um, and it can build them vertically. So, but how will these ecosystems then respond to climate change? So what of these processes are essentially being affected by increasing temperatures? So warming actually, you know, simultaneously, it accelerates sea level rise um, and it also can alter the in situ processes. So the biogenic processes, so primary production, decomposition and also that vertical accretion. So on the one hand, you have sea level rising and if, if, it's, um, if the, the rates of sea, sea level rise are very, very high, then that kind of overrides the biogenic processes and the marsh essentially drowns. OK. But if, if the rates of sea level rise are kind of moderate and that um, vertical accretion, so that, that input of sediments can keep pace, then it's likely that the marsh will be resilient and can survive. So it's kind of a combination of all of those. But when we have uh, temperature effects kind of solely, um, that can influence above and below ground productivity. So it can actually increase. So it's like as if the plants with slightly higher temperatures, are, their growth is stimulated and you get increases then in above and below ground productivity. And this can also uh, increase marsh resilience to a certain extent. But then on the one hand, and you know, it's it goes to show that nothing is really so cut and dry when we talk about uh, climate effects on uh, on biogenic uh, processes. But temperature driven increases can also basically occur with decomposition. So uh, the, the microbes essentially that are there, if temperatures are slightly higher, it can increase their metabolic activity and increase decomposition. So on the one hand, we're getting maybe a bit more plant growth, but on the other hand, we're getting um, more decomposition. So what's what, what's the, the kind of net effect? So that's really, really important for us to understand. And as I say, you know, there's give and take, there's pluses and negatives. So working out overall what's going on is, uh, is tricky. But uh, what we do know, so there's some international warming experiments taking place. Um, in these systems, in these coastal vegetated habitats or tidal salt marshes in particular. So one is situated on the Wadden Sea and that's just uh, commenced over the last few years. So that's called the Merit Project, the Marsh Ecosystem Response to Increased Temperature. And then we have the SmartX Project, which is uh, situated at the Smithsonian Environment Research Centre, where I did my uh, postdoctoral studies. And that's been going with about six or seven years now. So they have a, a good chunk of data that we can learn from. 
So they're actively warming the soil, uh, which is a kind of sophisticated approach. And the one at the Smithsonian is the first one uh, in the world to, to do so. There's other projects coming on board in um, Europe, such as Nordsalt, which is uh, funded by Biodiversa. And that's just, um, that's just beginning to kick off. But there is a need for more sites when we can learn a lot from these. But again, uh, a lot of information can be quite site specific when it comes to these habitats. So we need um, a broader, broader network of sites essentially. So what we do know, um, particularly for the North American salt marshes, um, was, was published in this particular paper, uh, Smith et al. in Global Change Biology this year. And so this uh, describes here a temperature optimum for marsh resilience. So what we're looking at here on the, on the y-axis is percent change in ecosystem response. So the dotted line across the middle is no change. Um, and on the, uh, on the x-axis is a latitudinal gradient going from more southern marshes to the northern marshes on the right-hand side. The arrows then represent the degree of warming. So slight increases in temperature is the greener colours and more extreme increases in temperature is the, more, is the red. So that's about five degrees, say. So what we're really looking at here is in the more northern marshes, we can see that if you increase the temperature, it actually does increase above ground and below ground productivity, and that leads to an overall ecosystem, positive ecosystem response. So we are seeing that with these moderate increases in temperature, that we are improving actually marsh resilience, which is very interesting. Then we look at the kind of the middle arrow, which begins to, to go down. So we get initially that increase um, with ambient temperatures, we get a kind of a positive uh, ecosystem response. But then if the temperatures increase too much, going to five degrees, that's tipping underneath that line. So overall, they, fa they found a temperature optimum. So when you get moderate amount of increases uh, in temperature, uh, about 1.7 degrees above ambient, uh, that, uh, that consistency maximizes root growth, that increases the vertical accretion of the marsh as well. It, it can build, so as those roots kind of grow very well, it builds the marsh volumetrically, um, and that leads to elevation gain, um, and then below ground carbon accumulation. So with those small amounts of increases <coughs> in uh, temperature, however, as the temperatures increase towards five degrees, then you get that shift then to a negative response. So decomposition is accelerating um, and we get uh, changes in what's called the microtopographic heterogeneity. So the kind of surface of the marsh begins to become a bit pockmarked and that can be a sign of an early warning sign that the marsh is actually uh, beginning to drown. And then on the other hand, when we move down to the lower marshes, we see that actually the lower latitude marshes in the, the, the Gulf Coast um, of Mexico and so on, we actually see that any increases in temperature uh, decrease that marsh resilience. So those marshes with increasing temperature are actually beginning to drown. Okay, so again, there's a continuum here, a latitude and continuum, and we want to know, well, where are European marshes on this continuum? Now, with the particular case in, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, those marshes or the data from that is actually just from one plant community. So again, we really need to understand, you know, across plant communities, how is this, how is, how is temperature actually going to play out? So, and again, uh, in terms of differences, those uh, marshes on the, in the Chesapeake Bay tend to be microtidal. We've got a lot of meso and macrotidal marshes here in Ireland, such as this one here down in County Kerry. So we want to know uh, when there's a, a sedimentation process that is dominant, how does temperature affect that? How will increasing temperatures also interact across seagrass beds? So we want to kind of push it out a little bit uh, more than just the, the one community. So what we're starting here was kicked off this summer is a new project that's funded by the Marine Institute um, and the EPA. It's called Blue Sea and it's very broad. It's three university partners. So overall, we're investigating um, Ireland's blue carbon potential through a scientific, socioeconomic, <laughs> legislative approach. So it is very broad in its remit. But as part of that, we want to establish a long term monitoring site where we can actually uh, warm and, and carry out these climate manipulation experiments. 
So what we what we plan to do, so as I said, it's just kicked off this summer. So we're looking now for sites um, around the country where we where we can do this. So we're going to commence with a passive warming experiment. So where we are deploying PVC chambers, there'll be uh, temperature loggers, hobo loggers within these. And um, that will naturally, the PVC chambers will, will passively warm uh, the above ground biomass. Um, and we'll be looking then for those changes across a number of years. We'll also be looking at surface elevation change through the deployment of surface elevation tables. Um, and we'll be looking at the, any changes as well in carbon accumulation. And we do want to extend that right down into the intertidal seagrass habitat of the Zostra Nalti zone. So again, just in terms of this is um, the kind of start of it. We want to establish this uh, site and then we want to move to increase the sophistication of the climate experiments that we can do there. So this is kind of stage one as such. Um, but just in terms of the importance of this and pinning it back to management, as I spoke in the beginning. So we need to understand how permanent that carbon is in the soils of these habitats. And again, that's important for climate mitigation. It's important for carbon accounting and financing, any financing projects and so on. They need to know, well, is that carbon going to be there in 100 years time, for instance? So we do need to determine the, the, the impacts of warming temperatures. Um, and we do need to have more sites globally because you know, we can, we can take some information from obviously the, the, the north coast of, of America, but they said one of those experiments, it's just one plant community. And we know the differences um, between species even is, can, be quite, can be quite large. So we need to determine that and as well in these macro and mesotidal areas. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Grace. Our final speaker before we go to the discussion itself is Emer Manning. Uh, Emer holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Sustainability, where she focused on marine and freshwater environments. She was appointed as Ireland's All-Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador from 2019 to 2020, and now continues as an All-Atlantic Ocean Youth Mentor. That's a big task. Uh, Emer now works on the climate justice and as sorry works as the climate justice and youth development officer at the National Youth Council of Ireland, and the title of Emer's talk is the importance of including a climate justice approach in your research. Emer, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for having me here today. Um, before I begin, I just want to give a bit of a personal announcement. I had throat surgery last week, so if I need to take a drink or a cough or my voice sounds a bit weird at any point, that's why. So please forgive me. Um, but my presentation might be a little bit more abstract than the presentations that came beforehand, but please bear with me. It shouldn't be abstract, it should be very important, and I hope you'll understand why by the end. I want to introduce myself to you all first because I'm not currently in the academic circle, so you might not know who I am. Um, but I have a Master's of Science in Marine Sustainability. Um, I, as mentioned, was the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador with the European Commission Healthy Seas and Healthy Our and Oceans Unit, and I'm currently still a mentor there. It's a wonderful initiative if you haven't heard of it. It allows young early career professionals to uh, have input in policy, to begin grassroots projects uh, based on their topics of interest with the ocean. Um, but what about now? So I currently work in the National Youth Council of Ireland and I'm strange in that I'm right in the centre of a Venn diagram. I am a young person who works with and for other young people. Um, and basically the National Youth Council of Ireland is an umbrella organisation for voluntary youth organisations in Ireland. So, for example, if there is a policy coming out and the Irish government is kind of opening that call for consultation, the NYCI, the National Youth Council of Ireland, will reach out to all of those other youth organisations and we will collate a response to that policy if it affects young people. Um, so essentially, if it's important to young people, it's important to us. And recently we have discovered that one of the most recent topics of interest is called climate justice. Some of you may know what climate justice is and understand it and practice it in your research. And if you do, thank you. Uh, if you don't, I would like to introduce you to climate justice today. I want you to have a look at this graph. It shows the global greenhouse gas emissions by country based in 2021. And I want you to just take a second of silence and just read the countries on the graph. Okay, so I'm going to 
do a little bit of a separation of this graph now just to show you that the top 10 greenhouse gas emitters contribute over two thirds of global emissions. So the rest of the world only contributes 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And those top 10 countries that you just read are over two thirds of those contributors. And things get even more interesting when I push that graph over to the side like this and compare it to the 10 richest countries in the world. And if you read through the countries on that richest countries in the world list, you will find an awful lot of overlap with the pie chart. So you'll see the United States, China, Japan. You'll see a lot of countries from that EU 27 bracket uh, and India. So there is some correlation in the amount of wealth that a country accumulates and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that that country actually kind of contributes to the atmosphere. Um, and this uh, issue of the wealth imbalance, the wealth divide and the amount of gas emissions that these countries are producing is where we kind of begin our journey into climate justice. This is a published uh, or sorry, a paper published in the Lancet uh, Commission on Pollution and Health. Um, in this case, pollution in this context is mainly looking at fossil fuel combustion. And I just want to read for you the executive summary of this paper. Pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death in the world today. Diseases caused by pollution were responsible for an estimated 9 million premature deaths in 2015, which is 16% of all deaths worldwide, three times more than deaths from AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria combined, and 15 times more than from all wars and other forms of violence. In the most severely affected countries, pollution related disease is responsible for more than one death in four. Pollution disproportionately kills the poor. And this was taken from the most recent IPCC report. People who are poor and have few resources with which to adapt are thus much more seriously negatively affected by climate related hazards. And this is where we get into the definition of climate justice. This is tricky. There actually is no definition of climate justice. It has not been formally defined, but everybody who does have their own definition of climate justice tends to stick to the same principles. So what I've done is gone and kind of combined all of those and created a definition for you all here today. In three parts, climate justice makes global warming an ethical and political issue as well as an environmental issue. Climate justice looks at wealth inequality and historical responsibility of climate change. It also looks at human rights and factors that could continue a greater equity divide, such as race and gender. The next topic or the next uh, click on this is probably the most important one and the one you'll hear the most for climate justice. Climate justice is the understanding that those who are least responsible for climate change often suffer the worst consequences of climate change because they don't have those resources to pull themselves back out if something occurs. This was made really clear in the most recent IPCC report. So I'm going to show you a graph from chapter three. And the question is, which livelihoods and economic sectors are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in the oceans? And if you look in the top right, you can see like a vulnerability scale. And we're looking at that full circle, the full orange circle for very high vulnerability. So if we go to the first line where it looks at sectors, we can see that coastal populations and small scale fisheries are by far the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in the ocean. And the next line is livelihoods. And we can see that small scale fishers and shellfish gatherers, small island developing states and indigenous peoples are by far the most affected. And now I'm going to actually go back to my three fellow panelists and pull some information that you've already seen from their slides and tell you why there is a climate justice issue in what we're seeing here. So even in Ireland, we need a climate justice approach. So Dave's slides here looked at changes in the spatial distribution of spawning activity by Atlantic mackerel. When I see something like that, I have to think about those potential livelihood changes for fishers that actually would go and catch that mackerel. Are they going to push themselves into more dangerous waters to try and bring home the same stock? Do they need more fuel, in which case more money to be able to go and chase these fish if they start moving in further northern waters? 
So we need to look at their lives and livelihoods based on those distribution changes. Next, from Grace's slides, we saw that all about salt uh, water marshes and what happens if those salt water marshes start to drown, which could potentially be the case if the temperature keeps rising. So how will those marsh drownings affect biodiversity in the region? Where will these species go when their nurseries and habitats are permanently flooded? And then how will this affect local communities that live near the marshes? Will there be issues with humans and non-humans interacting more closely together? Uh, will the flooded marsh force locals to have to move? And do they have the finances available to them to move? And finally, in Jared's slides, he showed um, this changing habitats with climate change. When I look at something like this, it's really scary because not only do I see kind of pretty colors all moving up in a, in a graph, I see much, much more. The mass migration of all species, including humans, conflict and war over resources, especially water and crops, increased discrimination from different countries and people trying to move across borders to survive and get help, and disease spread. We've already, of course, had a pandemic, and unfortunately, when you have more animal-human interactions that are coming into play, or when you have melting ice caps um, that has kind of hidden pathogens inside us that have been trapped away for centuries, what happens when that starts to actually re-enter into our planet and into our atmosphere? So what can we do? So the first thing that I'm asking you all to do is to analyze your work. Can you seek investment for a climate justice approach in your work? Could your work or research affect a particular community or could the outcomes of your work affect a particular community? Is there scope to engage in citizen science in your research? If you are already working with a community, is there a way that you can support them in securing tenure and or access rights to resources and territories? Can our work support decision making processes and or fisheries agreements or reforms that are just, participatory and equitable? And finally, if possible, get involved in the community that you work in and that you work around including the voices of those with longer lived experiences in your field of research could not only offer you valuable insight, but can also build on trusted relationships that are inclusive of the diversity of actors in a coastal community. Remember, climate justice means caring for the needs of people while we care for the needs of the planet. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Emer, and thanks again to all our panelists for those very thought-provoking uh, presentations. Because of many of the people here uh, have, have braved the uh, travel chaos in Dublin airports to actually make it to be sitting here in the Aviva Stadium with us, um, we'll give you guys the first opportunity to ask any questions you might have to. Uh, so you might just introduce yourself and then say who your question is directed to, and then ask the question of that panelist. And we have a couple of fallbacks. So I have some really tricky questions, and we also have some possibly uh, some online questions. Maybe we're just keeping a, an eye on our online uh, contributors as well. So, would anybody? I know the ISIS community for many years are uh, always very keen to express an opinion and to uh, challenge a fellow scientist. Uh, so, is there anybody who'd like to ask a, a question or uh, see any hands? Pre, pre coffee break. Yeah, please. So, uh, my question is to, I think, basically first three presenters. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, developments of climate change, but it was always centered around the observations that we have or an estimate of the mean climate change, especially for the salt marshes. What is the effect of the warming? But I'm thinking about, okay, what about the extreme events that are induced by the warming? Will that not override all these small marginal effects from small uh, changes in temperature if the entire ecosystem is just destroyed in one great storm? 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so uh, particularly for salt marshes, so they you know, occur generally speaking in a deposition environment. And we have examples actually of, um, of uh, salt marshes on the west coast of Ireland that formed because of extreme events. So there's one down in Barley Cove in County Cork um, and there was a, a tsunami actually in the 1750s um, that deposited large amounts of sediment and then gradually a dune kind of system built up and then gradually salt marsh formed behind it. So absolutely right. So the extreme events are going to be really important and, and particularly for these habitats. And we do know that these extreme events can move massive amounts of sediment um, and that and, and again, it comes down to in, in our, these micro and mesotidal marshes that sediment supply, which will regulate um, which will regulate their ability to keep pace with sea level rise. So that's that's a really important point. And um, yeah, it's just understanding, I suppose, for us as well in terms of the management where these, ex I mean, maybe that's a bit hard to, to do to, to predict where these extreme events are going to occur. You know, it's going to be more frequent on the West Coast or the East Coast and so on, um, and then predict, but um, it's certainly a really important point. Jared, do you want to come in there? Because you have done a lot of work on extremes and, and how they might superimpose themselves on the, the general kind of slow trend in certain variables. Yeah, certainly. I think um, the important thing to remember, I think, with, with extreme events, and I'm thinking about Emer's presentation as well, is that people experience climate change through extreme events. So um, humans are very bad thermometers, for example. So we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a one degree uh, Celsius change between here and outside. But that's the kind of magnitude we're talking about over 20th century. But where you talk about something like extreme heat waves, so when I give a general climate change talk, I always give the example of the remarkable times we're living through. So in terms of excess mortality, if you look at France, for example, you've got a big peak in March, April um, 2020. But the next most comparable peak, which actually peaked higher than that, was the heat wave in 2003. So the kind of the real impacts, and because we're such a globally connected um, society, the heat waves and the impacts on people um, of these extremes throughout the, the, the world really kind of um, have, an, have an impact on all of us. Bring it back to kind of more marine stuff. Uh, the biggest kind of extreme thing that, that I've seen in, in recent years in terms of ocean change goes back to uh, 2009, 10 and 10, 11, when there was a real negative North Atlantic oscillation, which caused a very abrupt slowdown in the overturning circulation. And it's also saw it in your slides as well, in terms of the, the, the change in the fish distribution around a similar time. Um, so I think one of the things is that extremes can be hard as well. So, I mean, if you talk about something like heat waves, that's actually relatively easy. In, in terms of extremes, uh, you know, we know that we're, we're warming the mean and that the extremes go around it. If you talk about storms, that's very hard. So you, it's, it's still very difficult to attribute, say, the type of storms that we get in, in Ireland to, uh, to climate change. So it's kind of the vanguard, I suppose, of kind of like attribution of climate change. But in terms of experiential stuff, it's, it's absolutely essential. Thanks, Jared. Are there any other questions? It's really hard to see hands in here. You need kind of some kind of phenomenal night vision. Yeah. Please. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Um, and thank you also for including in climate justice session. As this is a great start of, of, of the conference. Unfortunately, the question is a bit like fish nerdy question, and especially for Dave. And um, I, I really um, empathize with the desire to now, for a few decades, we've been thinking about, oh, these fish are coming further north, um, but it's so complex and you have highlighted sometimes you, 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 see, you think you've found a trend and actually these are just a hazard situation. So what is the situation? What is the research in terms going? Because then, the, sorry, I'm going too long. <laughs> the, I'm curious about the simplification, but not the oversimplification. So is there an attempt um, to find maybe three or four species and the ratios between them, uh, similar to what you do with the, with the cod and the calanus or the herring and the calanus, whether mm -hmm. there are some two or three species of fish that actually are beginning to be used in terms of ratios to simplify and to get a more robust trend of what's happening. Sorry for the. So yeah, yeah, very long question, but that's fine. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, you can use, you can start to identify indicator species or species that you think are particularly vulnerable or particularly follow up a, 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 an environmental trend. And yeah, you're absolutely right. You can look at ratios between those. I think the, you know, a lot of what we've done thus far is, is, is the broad and dirty. You know, can you see something big going on? And then um, with the 
for instance, with uh, Louise's community stuff, you know, the first question was, is the community changing? Answer is not really. So where are those changes occurring? In what species? What does that tell you about the environment? And then can you use those to perhaps sort of tease apart those environmental influences? Um, I mean, what's really interesting is that species like cod and herring, which in the Celtic Sea are right at the southern end of the distribution, are not showing up any signs of, of not showing any particular signs of changes in abundance or their role in the community. So, yeah, indicator or indicator species, but we're still burrowing. We're still pulling it apart, just like you say. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, please, Kelly. Thank you. I have actually a climate justice question. Thank you for that presentation. You gave the example of how current people involved in fisheries might be affected by shifting distributions, but as distributions shift, we're also seeing them become available in areas where people may not fish them or have rights to fish them. I'm curious if you've seen good examples of sort of navigating that space of the, the stakeholder base essentially changing and the mix of people who are interested in species changing and uh, suggestions you might have for um, working in that arena where the people involved will fundamentally shift over time as well. Yeah, one of the most interesting uh, accounts of this, to me anyway, is in uh, a small archipelago in northern Scotland um, called Orkney. Um, and Orkney essentially got notification from the Scottish government that their region was going to be a special protected area. And um, a lot of um, different areas in Scotland, the two or three years previous were kind of classified as special protected areas or marine protected areas. And the Scottish government basically just came in and made sweeping statements and protected those areas. Orkney didn't want to do that. They had too many stakeholders that were involved. They are an archipelago. They were a community of fishers. So they wanted to have more of a say in what happened in Orkney. And, um, kind of how it was going to be implemented, managed, etc. So what happened was the community basically got together and um, propositioned the Scottish government that they would not just do consultations, that they would actually build a relationship with one another. And that turned into one of the most successful climate justice stories of developing a marine or special protected area where now the community has gotten so strong about protecting their special area and has got uh, so many tools that the Scottish government actually facilitated them to get that it's the community now that actually implements and manages that special protected area. The Scottish government don't have to do it. The people themselves have actually taken the onus to teach other people because they have a, a huge tourism um, industry in Orkney and they actually have now set up their own kind of um, tourist educational centres to teach people about how they expect them to act in their special protected network. Um, so that's a really good example of a community basically saying we want to take control of what happens in our community. But also, if it's going to be a special protected network and it's going to affect our fishers in terms of what they can fish, what they can catch, then we want to have a say in what that looks like. So it really is a case of anybody who is going to facilitate something like that to realise that there are different ways of kind of participation. There's the participation where you basically tell somebody that something is going to happen and they accept it or not. There is the consultation step but then it's really that relationship building piece that is absolutely vital to making these things work. So if you are in an area where you can relationship build with the community that you work with, you really should look into aspects of doing that. And I recommend you to all look up, it's called, it's, it's a bit different, it's called community-based social marketing, which doesn't sound like something that would fit in here today, but it is. It's basically where a community, such as the community of Orkney, um, basically make it, an unusual thing or make it a bad thing to not follow their eco-friendly practices, whatever that may look like. So it's a pretty interesting area of research and I recommend having a look at it if it's something that you think could benefit you and your, your research. Thanks, Hammer. Um, are there any other questions? This is perhaps a bit um 
a horse before the court or the cart before the horse, uh, but with the distributions of the fish on the first two presentations, have you looked at the functionality of the species interactions and the climate uh, life cycles, which could be driving the distributions? So Dave, that's definitely Dave. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I understand if you mean the interactions between the life history stages within a species or between species? Both. Both. Um, yeah, to, to some extent we have. I mean, it's um, limited resources and a big issue. Um, the, the, the obvious thing is that recruitment events may be a very strong factor here. You know that uh, uh, the the fish are recruiting well in particular circumstances, but you know that whole business of of um, extreme events. If those extreme events hit at the wrong time, you'll get different responses to them. So you're you're dealing with the phenology aspects as well of when they're spawning, when they're trying to spawn, and the phenology of their prey as well, their prey and their predators. So I mean this this is obviously begging for um, food web modeling and then end to end modeling, I guess. Um, but then the problem arises that the, the sort of end to end model that can encompass that degree of variability becomes pretty complex. So then you have to fall back onto some fairly simplistic models to explore those particular effects. So yeah, we're, we're on the road to doing that, but not done very much yet. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Mark, and I might at the, at the same time ask our colleague to just check the online because I'm conscious that yes. many of our uh, attendees are, are online as well. I'm not saying much. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hello, it's a, it's a question for the panel, but stimulated Mark Dickey Collis, Chair of the Advisory Committee, um, uh, but stimulated by the comments of Dave. Um, I almost have to apologise internationally that we don't show any major signs in some of our demersal fish in the Northeast Atlantic shelf regions. Um, and I, I sit there and I almost get the feeling at meetings people say, think we're not looking hard enough or we're, we're not taking it seriously enough. And I, I wonder, is, is there a real challenge to the credibility of our work that we, we're just not seeing these signals and people think we should? Yes and no. Uh, I, I, I think, I mean, the thing as Jared said, there's there's like there's pretty obvious stuff and there's there's non-intuitive stuff. You know, why is that happening? And I think, uh, you know, the, I think it is our job to give the news, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or confusing, um, and admit that we don't know in some cases. So I think, yeah, I mean. Thus far in, in these waters, we haven't seen much in the way of, of climate change effects. That doesn't mean there isn't going to be such. And that's what that's the frustrating part is, you know, we can't make predictions on that basis because we have to wait and see what happens. We, or if we do make predictions, we're using out of area um, knowledge to do that, which is always a risky thing. So, yeah, it, it, it is it is incredibly difficult to admit you don't know, but I think we sort of have to sometimes, Mark. I could maybe come in uh, from a kind of a ocean circulation perspective as well, in terms of an analog of that kind of debate. In in terms of like the ocean circulation community and in AMOC changes, we're kind of constantly. Um, I've written papers in the last two years, one which said there was no change in the AMOC, and another one which said it was at, at, at its weakest in 2000 years. And neither of them contradicted each other, but it's a real communication problem because, uh, and I think one of the key things is remembering your audience. So I think, you know, in a forum like this, you guys are going to have scientific challenges that are going to be, you know, related to questions like that, related to some of the other questions we've had to be kind of, you know, battled out in terms of scientific knowledge. If you're communicating to a different audience, then it's a different mode of communication as well. So, you know, I think um, even I've started using the phrase the Gulf Stream system. You know, uh, I usually have to start off by saying, um, you know, the Gulf Stream is not the AMOC and uh, this kind of stuff. Scientists get really annoyed, like AMOC scientists get really annoyed if you say the Gulf, Streams, the Gulf Stream instead of the AMOC. So, you know, in terms of the language, you have to change it depending on your audience. So I say the Gulf Stream system because I know everybody can touch base with it. So I think in terms of the audience that you're that you're talking to, um, the messaging does need to be kind of worked on, and that needs to be borne in mind by scientists as well. Yeah, and I, and I did exactly the same thing when I said populations moving north 
the, the it's not the population moving north, it's just they do better further north and less well further south, but you just shortcut it and call it migration. Pierre, yeah, we'll just take one more question because I think it's we're pushing into the very input. Please go ahead. Yes, I'm also triggered by this, uh, the, the same subject and and I think it's if if we don't see a change and there isn't, then uh, uh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If we don't see a change, but there, there is one we have not seen, then we are in the difficulty. Yeah. But we, we would like our ecosystems to be resilient. And so we would like them not to change too much. So uh, uh, I think the, the question is, how can we characterize resilience? Uh, um, and, and if you are in a situation where it is resilient, you don't see a change, then you, you, you're sort of uh, uh, um, uh, telling you, you, you're sort of sure, surer. Right? So it's, you're talking about interactions, and I think it's we need to go much more deeper into that and understanding the interactions and the criteria for resilience. I don't know whether we, you would agree with that. No, I, I, I would definitely agree with that. And, and I think I think one of the previous questions also sort of touched on this, taking big averages, you know, multi-species or a whole community or something, is really only the, fir the first place you go. You do want to start looking at particulars of the situation. You know, one, one of the things that, that we just started to work on is that um, e ecosystem overfishing context in the Celtic Sea. And what that tells you, and the first signs are that it's actually quite a productive area, which leads to initially at least to high resilience. But but if you then um, if you then overfish in that and push it over the edge, it then has a lot further to come back in the the hysteresis of recovery. So yeah, there's a lot of the devil's in the detail, as they say in English. So, but the big picture is there's nothing massive going on right now. This is not like. The, the ice is receding 200 kilometers every year. This, these are really subtle changes. And, and I think the other key problem is, is that when you're looking particularly at demersal fishes, is, is that you know, even in the more better managed fisheries we have now, they're still experiencing a massive mortality every year from one source, fishing. And, and so you're trying to always tease the, the other signals out from that massive fishing effect, and it's it's not easy. I think what you've highlighted there, Dave, is there's going to be work for IC scientists for many years to come, and uh, lots of questions that we still need to to, to work upon, and uh, you know, a bright future for our early career scientists who are going to. Uh, embark on a career in, in, in fishery science and oceanography and uh, in blue carbon and so on and in the climate justice side of things, which is going to become much more prominent over the coming years, we hope. So uh, we are uh, eating into the, the, uh, the break time. So I'm going to just thank our panelists again. And